uh, for continuous groups. And then I give you two examples that look essentially the same, uh, up to you know changing your notation. But um, I want to point out, or I guess I want to spend the next hour talking about, um, although they look the same, uh, there's something much more subtle about the gauge theory. <coughs> Uh, and maybe one way to say it is that gauge theory is part of it. So, um, right, so uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we did the maximal theory, but really our goal, or at least my goal for these lectures, was really to be able to um, get, get you guys up to speed and to tell you how uh, a higher form symmetry works in uh, a non abelian uh, gauge theories, are not a billion million mills, and really with the hope of getting eventually to QCD. Um, because that's where sort of all of the new interesting things happen, and uh, yeah, so that's my goal. So first, uh, I hope you guys like math, because um, my, my plan for today is to just give you a lot of math, and then uh, tomorrow we'll talk about all the physics stuff. Um, so if it gets confusing at any point, please do stop and ask questions. Um, so, t now I'm going to sort of tell you formally, what is a gauge theory? And, uh, uh, as I said, I'm trying to get to QCD, but I think, I'm hoping these will just be helpful regardless, um, just because I think it's really good to understand gauge theory. So, we're going to work in sort of general dimensions. Um, and I'm going to imagine I have some space time, which I'm going to write uh, as M. And we're going to take our gauge uh, group to be G. So, um, gauge theory is the quantum theory of what are called principal G bundles. So, a principal G bundle is a space, it's a geometric space P, which looks like uh, a uh, a G fiber or fiber over your space time now. And so what the heck does that mean? So what I mean is take some small point, uh, uh, so take any point X inside of that, inside your base, so this is called the base, which is our space time. And this is our fiber. And this is called the G bundle, or the principal G bundle. Okay, so um, you take a point X in here, and then look at what uh, the whole space looks like restricted to that point X. You find that P restricted to X and M is literally equal to G. So at every point in space time, you have a copy of your gauge group G. And so if you just take, so now let's draw a picture. So here's our space M. Here's my point X. So at this point X, I have a copy of G. So now um, what you want to do is think about some small neighborhood of X. I'm going to call this uh, U, uh, zero, well, U sub X, I guess. And, uh, now what we can do is try to think about what uh, P looks like at, uh, on this uh, small area. So um, essentially what, what happens is when you look at P uh, over this small area, it just looks like um, for every point X inside of your manifold, you get um, a copy of G, and so it, it, what you want to say is that, um, give, yeah, so given a, a, what's called a, a section at least, is um, for every point X, I give you a function that's valued in G. So, in other words, if you take a point, and pick a point in your X, and you pick a second point Y here, and you pick some fixed element here in G, fiber over x, and you look at what happens to g as you move from x to y. <coughs> g will go to some, g of x goes to some g of y. 
So what that means is the entire fiber of your G here is rotating as you move from X to Y. So that's what it means to have a principal G bundle. It's uh, you take your space time and you take a copy of G and you let it rotate as you move through your base manifold. Okay. And these rotations will be group. Yes, exactly. And the group is itself G. Okay, good. So this, this is sort of physically what it means to have a gauge theory. Um, but now we really <laughs> want to relate this back to how we talk about Lagrangians and everything like that. So um, as you were saying, uh, this sort of picture is, uh, is some sort of nice story. Um, but the point is that actually there's uh, there's actually a redundancy in this uh, description. So essentially, this only works very for very small areas. So I took x and y to be in the same sort of local region, but if I took some z over here that's very far away, it's not necessarily true that uh, x and y will be, uh, um, uh, well, this will, this will be the same function. So, so if we take, I'm gonna blow this picture up, so now imagine we have some neighborhood of x here and some neighborhood of z here. And say I want to track um, how the group rotates going from x to z. So this is my neighborhood of x, this is my neighborhood of z. And this is what I'm going to call uh, my neighborhood X and Z, which is just, you know, the overlap of the two. Uh, which, okay, maybe I shouldn't do that. Call it Z. So this cup means the overlap. And so what happens is that, uh, so now let's just use uh, uh, X to mean uh, the, this, this function here uh, restricted to um, uh, to uh, the set U of X, or the neighborhood of X, and we'll use G sub Z to mean the neighborhood of G, uh, the, the, the same function but in the neighborhood of Z. And what happens is when you go from one of these neighborhoods to the other, you actually have to multiply it by an additional function, uh, G of X. <clears throat> and uh, these are called transition functions. And uh, these encode the entire topology of um, a given p-bundle. So everything you, you hear about gauge theory uh, having some sort of uh, uh, topological operator, or some sort of topological configuration, like an instanton or a monopole, is a particular way that your uh, G is fibered over spacetime. So we can do some sort of weird winding, or, well, it's always some sort of weird winding because we can't draw in very many dimensions. Um, <clears throat> but that winding is always encoded by these transition functions. And these transition functions are uh, constrained uh, well, to be sort of consistent in a way. So if you had three sets, so now I'm going to start to be calling them x1, x, or xi, xj, and xk. And I'll call the neighborhoods even pi UJ and UK. Um, and so now for each, uh, going from each uh, set to, from each like, neighborhood to the other, you have some uh, transition function UIJ, UJK, or UKI. Uh, and there's a consistency condition <coughs> that UIJ times UJK times UJ inverse to the identity. And that means essentially if you, if you pick the point here, like xi, you went here, you went here, and you came back, then you would have done nothing. You would find that this sort of, as you track it, um, you, you, you sort of go back to the same place. Um, cool. And so, uh, yeah, so as I was saying, the set of all, all of these UIs, and these GIJs uh, specifies an exact P bundle. And these are what you sum over in the path integral. You can sort of uh, 
you can kind of think of gauge theory as a version of a quantum gravity where you were summing over uh, a space time that looks like P, where you keep this base manifold fixed. Um, yeah. So uh, these transition functions are encoded by what we call a connection. Um, and essentially, this allows us to compare uh, what the fiber is at different points. Uh, X, Y, X, between different points on the, on the manifold. And so a connection A um, is locally something that's valued in, in the Lie algebra uh, of G. And uh, in terms of these Gs, uh, well, these Gs, which I guess I started calling G sub i's here uh, in this picture. A uh, in the space I is like G inverse of I of X, G, G, I of X. And so if you want to go from one point to another, um, X, I to X, I time, then you can integrate G, I of X um, is equal to. I guess it's g i of x i is equal to e to the i integral from x i prime to x i of a i g i of x i And this is the Wilson line that we wrote earlier. Yes? So why is it that if you move from one space to another and go back to the same place, it's like we have never moved? Because for me, that Looks like uh, Napoleon's theorem triangle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Right. Um, good. Sorry. Uh, you are correct. I explained that um, incorrectly, I think, actually. Um, so uh, this picture is still correct, but um, really what you want to think of is you have a, you have a single point here. Call it, uh, I don't know, let's call it Z again. So Z is in the overlap of U1, or UI with U, J, UK. And so essentially there's three ways of parameterizing um, this single point, the fiber at the single point. And so uh, they're all given by different functions. So it's like the guy who started here at XI can sort of walk over to Z, and I have my GI function. This person has his GK function, and this one has his GJ function. And so if you want to compare all of them, uh, if I talk to, if GI talks to, to the guy who's GK, or GJ, then they compare with this function. And then, yeah, so, uh, yeah. And, and then G, the person J and K compare with this function. And then, so if, if these two people compare I and J, and then J and K compare, they better match with this I and K. So essentially it's the way of saying that everybody who measures um, what the fiber looks like there better see the same thing. That's, that's the same thing. Um, is that, does that, does that help at all? Um, you were correct that it's not about moving around, it's about different people measuring the same point using a different uh, basis. Because um, it's, like, it's like being here, it's like, so if this is a point Y, this is like saying this person X, what goes to Y and measures this, and this person uh, starting from Z goes to Y and measures this, and they're related by this transition function. And the transition function is literally just a way of different people uh, telling each other how they are related. Yeah. Um, yeah. And these transition functions are uh, often what we call a, a gauge symmetry. This, this is literally what the gauge symmetry is, in the sense that, uh, you know, uh, sorry. This is how the gauge symmetry is encoded. Um, and it's essentially saying that there are two ways of describing the same thing, or multiple ways of describing the same thing. And so this is saying that if you, uh, yeah, if you go around the, the circle in a gauge symmetry, it's totally trivial. Yeah. Um, right, 
So, um, so, so maybe another way to say this. So, so first, uh, this picture is um, kind of like saying. Uh, so, if we go with this picture um, to describe what the connection is. So, if you say the person at x wants to describe y, um, you start at x, and then you integrate the connection from x to y. That's how you walk from here to here. But then, if the person um, at y wants to switch to the, how they talk to z, you would do a gauge transformation. So, essentially, if you want to compare, and then you can go from g, uh, g y to x. So, what I'm saying is g of z, of z looks like e to the i integral of y to z of a uh, in the z patch times uh, g uh, x z, or I guess, yeah, z, e to the i integral from x to y, g x. So um, this is what happens when you go from here to here, and you do your, your flip, and then you go from there to there. And the way this, uh, this sort of transformation is encoded is that <coughs> there's actually a gauge symmetry. A uh, in the coordinate z is just equal to j x z inverse a x g x z plus g x z inverse g g z. So if you uh, instead think of instead of a being uh, local as being some sort of globally defined thing that just does the same transformation when you go. From one coordinate patch to, or from one uh, patch to the other, then you would just say G of Z is e to the i integral of a from x to z of G of x. So the connection really tells you how this fiber rotates, and um, the gauge transformations are telling you that well, locally you can write it as some function. But then when you go from, to, from one uh, area to another, you actually have to do this comparison. This is the same as the parallel transport. Yes, this is exactly how parallel transport works. Or this is another word for parallel transport. Um, okay. So that's great. This is a totally useless way to describe how gauge theory works. Um, well, okay, not totally useless. We, we, we sort of know how connection physically acts on this space. Um, but the, essentially the question you want to ask is how do you describe, or yeah, how do you describe P uh, usefully? Right? Um, if, I, if I just give you the entire space and all of its topology, that would be great, but that's a, a lot of data. That would be like giving you a, a manifold and a metric and topology, and for general spaces, that's really complicated. So the connection is a simpler way um, to tell us how this works. Um, but the connection also isn't well-defined. Well, it's not uh, locally well-defined, because it has this gauge symmetry. So different people uh, in different patches would see different, or could give you a different, uh, a different connection, and it would be hard to tell if you guys are describing the same space or not, unless you do the exact transformation between them. <coughs> so there's sort of two pieces of data um, that tells us how to encode uh, the information of a gauge theory. So there's the first one, which is um, via loops. And uh, by loops, I mean, uh, well, these are also called uh, monodromes. Or along waves, um, or sometimes they're called Wilson lines, but I think uh, I don't like this language. Um, Wilson, like in a gauge theory, a Wilson line is an operator, um, even though it classically looks like a well, right now. Um, so essentially, the point is if your manifold M 
has some interesting non-trivial topology, or not really, doesn't matter. If you take any um, loop in this space, you can pick a loop that's non-contractible, you can pick a loop that is contractible, whatever you like. Um, given a loop gamma, you can define uh, you, well, you can you can write down something that has information, uh, which is just integrating your connection oops, on this loop. This is, gives you something that's uh, value in G, and essentially tells you um, how the fiber transforms as you go around this, uh, like a loop, for example. So if you go from I to J to K, and then you can uh, you do this integral, it tells you. It, how, how the fiber uh, rotates as you go around this loop. So as you said, uh, for example, if you're on a, if you're, uh, for example, on a sphere, and you pick a direction, uh, this is not good one. So if you pick a direction, and you parallel transport it, so you take your arrow, you walk down this line, so here, you're, you're pointing down, and then you walk across, still point it down, then you back up. You'll find that your arrow is rotated. So this is some way that, um, uh, that autonomy can tell you that there's information um, about your gauge bundle. So here, the, the gauge bundle is actually a uh, pretended manifold. Uh, so this is sort of just an analogy. <coughs> okay. So um, the other piece of data we have um, is the field strength. <coughs> right. So the field strength um, F is, uh, is given by the DA which the commutator uh, will itself. So for U1, this is something that's gauge invariant. And uh, uh, so for U1, this is gauge invariant. And actually, the connection tells you everything, well, almost everything about, so the field strength tells you almost everything about the connection. So um, if you took one of these loops, so e to the i integral, uh, sorry, just integral of a along this loop here, if you notice that you can fill this in, you realize that you can actually, so we call this uh, disk d. This is just going to be equal to the integral of the field strength on this disk just by using Stokes theorem. So this is the way that the field strength really encodes almost everything about the connection. The cases where this doesn't work is when you have a loop that you can't contract because then you can't fill it in and then you're missing some of the data. So the connection, if you measured it for every loop, would tell you with some way that you could reconstruct the geometry and topology of this space but uh, again, that's a lot of data. It's very complicated. <coughs> so for you one, this is nice. Um, but for non-abelian gauge theories, this is actually really complicated again. Because again, this is not actually a gauge invariant. So for non-abelian gauge theories, uh, what we can try to do is make gauge invariant combinations with field strength. So, for example, if you do stuff that's polynomials and that, you can also do stuff that looks like uh, polynomials in F. Uh, you can do also F and star F. And then you, you, know, you can try to square this and stuff, do, do things like that. Um, that's cool. Um, but these are the ones uh, that are actually generally the most useful. And the reason is that these don't depend on the metric. So there's no n metric dependence. And so what it means is that this is actually capturing the topology of this space P. These are called characteristic classes. And 
then so the sort of basic one that's the most important in four dimensions is trace of f edge cuff. And when you integrate this, this is known as the instant on number. And so this is really important for confinement and uh, things like this. But what it's telling you is that uh, for whatever your group is, um, this manifold is totally twisted. And there's no small deformation that you can do or any sort of perturbative excitation of this gauge field that can undo this twisting. So in this sense, you can think of instant noise as topologically protected. And uh, as Jose was mentioning earlier, these are sort of uh, protected by uh, what are sometimes called a churn uh, uh, file symmetry. Uh, there might be a Y instead of It's going to be one. It's with the Y for the uh, symmetry. And uh, it's almost a silly reason that these are conserved, though, um, because if you, you can write down a current for this, um, where the uh, you know, sort of star of J is just trace of that point of. Oh, yeah, this is also something I did not mention earlier, is that if you're in, uh, in this is nice and clean. Okay. Uh, if you're in D dimensions, and you, you have a, a D form, oh, uh, if you're in P dimensions, and you have a P form, then the exterior derivative is automatically zero. Um, yeah, that's just because essentially you can't anti-symmetrize more than uh, more indices than there are the dimension of the manifold. So, anyways, so the topologically protected uh, um, feature, you don't need this sort of current argument. It just is topologically protected because um, it is a topological uh, property that you can write down of this uh, manifold. Okay. What do the mathematicians call this? This is called this is called two things. It's either called the first contradiagonal class. Or the second churn, uh, the second churn character. Um, okay. So we're, we're starting to run short, short on time, but now we're in a position uh, where we can talk about what it means to turn on one form symmetry. Exactly say what this one means. Here I mean that it's one as an element of the group. So um, that seems like maybe a silly thing to specify, but it's actually very important. And I'd like to give you an example of why. So um, two of my favorite groups are SU2 and SO3. SU2 is a two-fold cover of SU3, SO3. And SO3 is just SU2 um, mod C2. Uh, and what that means is that, uh, so that there's, what it means is that uh, minus one in SU2 is being identified with the identity. That's what this means. Okay. So if you have an SU2 bundle um, for any triple intersection, uh, this has to be equal to 1 in SU2. Cool. That was obvious, maybe. Um, but if you want to look at so this for SU2. So for SO3, <coughs> um, formula would replace this is one in SO3. 
However, since SO3 is a sub, lives inside of SU2, you can think of any SO3 bundle as in terms of some SU2 bundle that uh, you, um, yeah, you can think of it in terms of some SU2 bundle. So, uh, so from here you can go to, I'm just gonna call these hats for when I go to an SU2 bundle. But now, the relation is not necessarily that this is equal to one in SU2. It can also be equal to minus one in SU2. And so, uh, it's like you had broken uh, this condition. And so, uh, what it means is that there are SO3 bundles. Even though SO3 lives inside of SU2, there are ways you can go from, S, uh, there are ways you can sort of wrap SO2 around manifolds that are not allowed in SU2. And uh, maybe the, the, the best way to see this is actually by going to the U1 case. So there's a difference between U1 and U1 on C2. It's essentially the same thing. So U1 is actually looks the same as U1 on C2, except here I'm saying that minus one is identified with one. So if I take a U1 bubble, I do my uh, formula here. So a U1 bubble has this, whereas U1 mod Z2 bundle can have one or minus one. And so essentially what it means is that if, you, if you're not able to differentiate between these, you're allowed to twist a little bit more than you would have otherwise. And uh, so that's cool. Um, but what, what does it mean? So there's actually a sort of characteristic class that uh, is of this type that classifies whether or not you have some bundle here that can be realized as an SU2 bundle, or as a U1 mod Z2 bundle that can be realized as a U1 bundle. So um, <coughs> uh, this is called uh, this is called some sort of sometimes it's called a discrete flux. Um, but it's usually written as W2 of SO3 or W2 of U1 2 And these are, think, are this is an H2 class. Oh, sorry, it's a, a, it's a two form. This is also a two form. And importantly, these two forms have integrals either zero or one. And so uh, the way you um, um, yeah. So the reason why this is important, besides telling you some topology about your uh, gauge theory, is that um, when you allow for bundles that have this sort of uh, discrete flux in it, the instant time number changes. So for an SU2 theory, trace f by jeff um, with the correct normalization, which I'm going to write as h pi squared, uh, this is an integer, always. Um, for an SO3 bundle, that's not true. to an integer plus um, one half, or actually it's one fourth, times the integral of w2 wedge w2. So this can, in the most general setting, be uh, one fourth. And um, I think tomorrow I will be telling you about um, all of the crazy things that you can do with this. Um, but 
I'd first like to go back to the Maxwell example we did. So in the U1 Maxwell theory, we said there was a U1 uh, one-form symmetry, which was the electric symmetry. Um, in the, in the, the action, we turned on a background gauge field. Essentially what we did is we replaced the field strength F with F minus uh, B, I guess we wrote as 2, of E. Um, and really what we're doing is, um, so this is a U1 gauge field. And this is still a U1 gauge field. Um, but this entire thing now, you can actually realize as a U1 uh, mod uh, something gauge field. Turning on this B2 actually uh, activates these sort of discrete fluxes. So um, in this case, you're activating an entire U1 uh, worth of discrete flux inside of the F. So that's usually very confusing. But essentially, if I, if I turn on a BE, uh, which, which is 1 half, then what you're actually looking at is a U1 mod Z2 gauge field. That's what it really means to turn on this background gauge field. So, um, and more generally, um, what we're going to, oh, I'm just going to tell you right now. If you have a G gauge theory, um, the center of the group corresponds to a one-form center. Um, right, so just to make sure we're on the same page, the center of the group is the set of all group elements that commute with every other group element. So um, that's why, so, so for an abelian group, uh, erased everything. Um, for an abelian group, all elements commute. So that means that the center of the group is the entire group. For SU2, the only element of SU2 that commutes with everything inside of SU2 is just minus one. So, so more generally, uh, whenever you have a Z gauge theory, or a, 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 gauge, a G gauge theory, you get a one-form symmetry that corresponds center symmetry that corresponds to the center of the group, and this is often called center symmetry. Um, let me this number one. So what it means to turn on a background gauge field uh, which often rate is a B two uh, background gauge field uh, for Z of G means that you replace your G gauge field with a G mod Z of G gauge field, where there's this sort of obstruction. You have this discrete flux where you break this uh, triple overlap condition um, by this B2. So uh, B2, when you integrate it, is a, a group element inside of G. And it tells you uh, what happens on these triple overlaps. And more generally, what we're going to find is that this formula is totally different. And um, this is important, for example, because APJ anomalies are controlled by uh, the instant time number. And so what you're going to find is that there's going to be new anomalies you can write down because you're changing uh, the quantization of your instant time number. And, uh, because you're doing this in non abelian gauge theory, you also get a um, whole new cool like, set of anomalies that you can use to talk about confinement. And so in the last uh, four minutes, uh, maybe I'll just say a couple more things about uh, symmetries in gauge theory. And then tomorrow, uh, we'll talk about, um, uh, we'll talk about sort of applications of this and then we'll um, end up by uh, talking about some uh, categorical symmetries, uh, just so, yeah, just because they're cool. Um, right, 
So, um, so in, uh, in, in GH theory, so here we can have in mind U1, for example. Um, you can always couple to charge matter. And when you couple to charge matter, that changes how much you're allowed to break this condition. And uh, the reason is you can literally think about uh, <coughs> breaking this condition as turning on a little magnetic, uh, little a Dirac string that has magnetic flux, a fractional magnetic flux shooting through it. So you think about just some really small tube and you turn on some magnetic field that goes through it that has some fractional magnetic flux. So literally the way this formula is related um, to uh, these you know, W whatevers is that or the, these B2 background gauge fields that this flux is literally equal to the integral of B2 on some small disk um, that the, uh, that's the, you think of the string piercing through. So B2 is literally measuring this fractional magnetic flux that you're sort of putting in your theory as a probe. Um, so what's happening is when you add charge matter, uh, there is a certain amount of angular momentum There's like a total angular momentum that's uh, inside of your gauge field, which is given by E cross B. And this is the uh, pointing vector. And so if you integrate it, you get the virtual space, you get the total amount of angular momentum in your gauge field. So the gauge field, as we know, is a spin one particle. That, so, so, yeah, so A mu is spin one. And so a spin one particle can only have angular momentum, which is multiples of one. Uh, so the total uh, J is integer. What happens when you have a gauge field, uh, sorry, if you put in one of these um, fractional magnetic tubes and you have charged matter, so imagine you put in some field inside here, um, the amount of angular momentum you have in the in the field, sorry, since the charge matter is electrically charged, and this is a magnetic string, E cross B is no longer zero. And what you find is that the total angular momentum is proportional to the charge of uh, the, the, the fermion, or whatever uh, matter you have, times magnetic flux. And so, essentially, you're only allowed to add in magnetic flux so that this is an integer. If you don't do this, what's going to happen is you're going to have branch cuts in your theory where sort of everything breaks down. And what you find is that there's going to be totally non-local effects in your gauge theory because you've broken it. That's what happens. So, um, <clears throat> so for example, if you have a charge, charge uh, P um, fermion that you add to your U1 gauge theory, so you go to QED with charge P matter. Um, your U1 electric symmetry is broken to some ZP electric symmetry. And that means you're only allowed to have um, magnetic flux, which is one over P value. So then you would find that you know, the charge of the fermion times magnetic flux is P times one over P, which is integrated. Everything is fine. Um, and so, so this is how uh, symmetries are broken, uh, how you can break a one-form electric symmetry in QED. For a non-abelian gauge theory, um, you also have uh, dynamical fields. For, yeah, so, uh, I, sorry, non-abelian gauge theory is interacting. U1 gauge theory is free, non-abelian gauge theory is interacting. And the reason is that you have gluon fields, gluons that are charged under the gauge field. And the fact that you have gluons is what tells you 
that what would have looked like a U1 uh, electric sym er, center symmetry is broken to Zn because gluons have charge n under uh, any sort of U1 you would put inside of your gauge field. And so that's why uh, non abelian gauge theory um, always has, oh, so this is for SU2. Um, and this is why uh, the center symmetry of any G gauge theory is given by the center because this is the thing that the gluons burn charge under. Um, and so we'll talk about confinement tomorrow and then uh, some other cool applications, but I want you guys to get dinner, so we'll stop here. Okay, before we go, any last questions for them? Okay, then uh, I wish you uh, a good evening, and I'll see you tomorrow morning.